literally gang pressed them off the dock two days before I left. I was desperate because I needed some people to help me steer the boat up to Tonga because it was in the middle of winter and there was very little sun coming through and it was the sun, um, not enough sun on the solar panels to power the automatic pilot. I w wanted to leave because there was a big southerly storm coming up and I wanted to go out and try and catch it to go north. Eventually we got into the storm and it got worse and worse and the, my crew were incapable of steering the boat. Well, when it first tipped upside down, I had a, a, a little moment of, oh no, my beautiful boat. And it was only there, just fleeting. And after that, I knew I had a job to do. When I was building the boat in, in Sydney, I had some people come up to me and they said, what happens if you turned upside down? And I said, oh, I have everything there. I have all my fishing gear. I said, all I have to do is float down the, down, down the tropics, because nearly everybody who gets into trouble on a yacht gets hit by a whale up by the Marquesas, you know, where it's nice and tropical. And there's lots of fish. So they, they go fishing there in the tropics and, you know, two or three months later they get rescued. There was a, another friend of mine who went back to their yacht one day in the Marquesas and it was gone. It had taken off and drifted. Well, months later it ended up on a reef down in Fiji. So I thought, well, you know, that's no problem. If I turned upside down, I just float all the way down through the tropics have a leisurely cruise upside down, just like Tom Sawyer, you know, on the boat upside down and, and fish, and then end up in Fiji, you see? So when it turned upside down, I thought, uh-oh, what's wrong with this? <laughs> what's wrong with this fucking picture? <laughs> because here I am in midwinter, in the, in the, roaring, in the roaring 40s, and 5,000 miles to, um, to Chile, so there was, no possible, no known way of ever coming back. <laughs> well, the, the boat was built as a trimaran, and trimarans, unless they're built out of steel or something else and don't have any insulation or anything, um, they won't sink. And this was all built out of PVC foam and, and glass, and it had a lot of other stuff in it too. So it just finds its static water level, and so the water le level in the cabin standing on the roof was up to about here somewhere. But okay, so it's it flipped right over? Yeah. Okay. Was, when it tipped up, up, upside down, Phil hit the panic button and he went along and kicked the, the cabin doors open and everything got swept out. We um, get as much as we possibly could and we threw it all into the aft cabin, which was a, which was a cabin down below the cockpit. So when the boat was upside down, it was the highest part. So we took everything we could find and threw it all in there and, and built it up above water level. So we had about 15 inches of, of headroom after we'd finished and about the size of a double bed. So the four of us were in that. I'd crossed over that barrier of thinking I could do it to just knowing that I was going to get out of it. I never had one thought, not one thought in the whole four months that I'd, of, of doubt that I, I, I wouldn't make it. Yet I knew that we were in an area where there was no, no escape, but I just knew I was going to get out. Yeah. In, in New Zealand, Bob McCarrow told me, uh, gave me this article by Al Siebert on the survival personality, and, or survivor personality. And Al Siebert was in the military. He studied people who'd who'd done survival and what made them tick and what, what made them special, what happened to them and all these sort of things. And this article was absolutely brilliant. I was down in Portland. So I looked his name up in the book and there it was. So I rang him up and I w went round to see him. So anyway, he told me this really neat story about this um, Alaskan guy who had um, gone out and uh, gone out with his mate on schema bills, and he had fallen in the fallen in the ice in the water, and he went down with all the ropes, and his mate had to run back to the to the village to get help. So by the time he got back, it was almost three, almost four hours, and when he got when they finally got to him, they had to chip him out of the ice because he had frozen in, and in those conditions, you're lucky to make it 12 or 15 minutes max before you die. They had to chip him out, and they got him out and took him, and they revived him. So Al 
um, interviewed him afterwards and they said, how did you do it? Because this, this is what he was into. And he said, I became the bear and I went into hibernation. And I thought, wow. And for the people who lived in the, in the wilderness in Alaska, it was naturally in them to become the bear or because they were living in nature, you see. Some military guys went on a survival exercise up in, in the Waikato there, one of those mountains. And they were seen the day before running around the barracks, you know, in their shorts, in the snow. You know, how, only how military guys can do, you know, not this. So that they went up there and they got into a blizzard. So being military guys, they thought, we'll fight our way out. So they decided to fight their way out. And I think either all of them or most of them died. Mm -hmm. But there was one lone Japanese guy who got caught in the same blizzard. He just dug a hole in the snow and, until it was all over and then walked down. So survival is, is about becoming is about becoming one with nature. It's not fighting it. Initially, I spent seven years sailing around the South Pacific on, on, on our first yacht. And that's what I built the boat for, was to be able to sail back up the islands again, because the Polynesian people are just the, the most beautiful people in the world. That was in 1968. And that was when you were travelling with David? Yeah, yeah. We sailed down the Roaring Forties, went down underneath the Chatham Islands, way down to 46 degrees south. And in the 28 days we were down there, we had seven storms, and they were all on the nose. We had a day and a half of the wind behind us. But in one of the storms down there, um, it was so bad that as we were sailing up them um, under the storm jib, we were going up and up and up and up and up. And the guy on the helm was, would be so nervous, he would say, we're going up, we're going up, we're going up, we're going up. Hang on, like this, as you go through the break in the top. And everybody in bed, you know, who were trying to be sleeping, they would hang on so they didn't get thrown out. And then we'd go down the other side. Mm -hmm. so, so how big are these waves? Um, they, were, they were big because in the moonlight you could see way, way up, in the, way up there you could see the, the break, you know. Okay, so we're talking like seven, oh, we're, ten metres? We're probably, um, they're probably 40 feet, something like that, I guess. We had, on one day, up, we, were, we were hove to in the storm because it got so bad. And we'd just taken some photos um, looking through the looking through the companionway outside, we weren't game to go outside at the time, so we took this photo outside of, of a of a of a sea. So I was reading a Reader's Digest in bed one day, and the other two were, other two guys were asleep. And next moment, I heard this noise, and the, and the noise was like a a locomotive. It was just a horrendous noise. And I looked up through the window, and there was a wave which was vertical, the, the wave was vertical. Um, and it would probably, would have been at least 60 foot high. And it was just a vertical wall of water. And you'll, um, in that video, uh, that TV thing of uh, Rogue Wave, was it Rogue Wave? They talked, all the people in there, the captains, they all talked about a vertical wall of water. Yet all the scientists will not believe them because there's no way you can have a vertical wall of water. And it's as though the captains who know about the sea don't know what a vertical wall of water is. They are enormous, they are terrifying, and they are usually fatal. An unexplained force that strikes without warning. Next thing I knew, we were upside down, fighting for our lives. One guy who was the captain of the Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, QE2, said it looked like the, uh, the, the cliffs of Dover. It was a vertical wall. And some of them would carry on. For One guy who got hit, well, one ship, they saw it um, about a mile off coming. And that's how long it stayed like that. And it, and it picked us up, and that's all I remember then, because it just picked us up. And then it, uh, 
that everything went black and then it dumped us. And it dumped us down into the trough of the wave, but it dumped us so hard that it cracked the, the hull underneath and the boat came back the right way. So I know, I know what a, a wave like that sounds like. It, it has a, a certain, certain sound and it's just like a locomotive. A real-life nightmare tailor-made for a Hollywood disaster movie. You'd think when you see the movie Poseidon that this has to be fiction, that this is Hollywood, but it's not. It's a mysterious power that cannot be predicted, prevented, or outrun. But today, scientists are finally beginning to crack the code of what are called rogue waves. And what I reckon it is, knowing nothing about physics or anything else like that, I reckon it is when you get several waves together and, a, a, and, a, and for some reason they become vertical. And in a normal wave, the, the water stays in the same place. It's the wave that moves, but the water stays there, you see. Now in a vertical wall of water, that whole water is actually moving. And all that weight up on top on that pushing down and running across, I reckon that makes the I reckon that makes the noise. And where were you? That was in the Roaring Forties. It was in the Yeah, down we're down about um, we're we're reasonably close to the Mare Theresa reefs, and at the time we thought uh, we were over a over a shoal area because on the chart it says you know to be be careful of shoal areas, but since then they found out that. When you get different temperatures down below in the water, it'll make the seas react as though that, that it's on a, on a shoal area. In fact, after that, we went through another storm and every wave was breaking. And, uh, and we were still a, a thousand miles south of uh, Rapa at that stage. And, and we were just it was rather hectic. So by the time we got to Rapa, our stomachs were churned, you know, they were churned up. So when we got caught in the storm, um, around about six o'clock in the morning, we did hear this big, I, uh, we, we heard this wave coming towards us and it was exactly the same sound. Even though I was inside, I knew exactly what it was because it was the same sound. And I'm probably the only one around surviving who, who, who's actually even heard of one and, and, and has, has, has survived. Because all the ones that most people come out of uh, are on ships and they just, and they probably wouldn't, they'd be in a cabin anyway and they wouldn't hear that sound. And I haven't heard anyone that, anyone that talks about the sound. Because all the other people who get hit by those, that, that would be curtains. Because there's, there's just no escape from something like that. So it just turned it straight upside down. I wanted, I wanted confirmation that, that what I was doing, I was on the right track. Because um, I really had no idea, you know, what, where we were, but I, I just wanted to know that what I was doing was okay, you know, that I was on the right track. Well, late that day, I saw, a ship, I saw a boat go by, you know, and the other guys, they got real mad because the boat didn't see us, the boat sailed on. To me, I thought, wow, yes, that's my confirmation, that's what I wanted to know. So we saw, we saw a ship go by on, I think, a couple of yachts and lots of planes, but they actually have to see you. So was that, was that for you a sign that you weren't heading toward Chile? That you were on, uh, I at, at that stage, I knew something was wrong, with because there shouldn't have been any yachts around about where we should have been, and the course that the, this yacht was on, uh, it was going nowhere, and the only only place it could have been going would would have been coming from the islands, uh, Mount Monganui, that, oh, Bay yeah, Bay Plenty, yeah. So I knew, I knew we'd we'd headed north. For some reason, we'd, we'd, we'd gone a, a long way north to have seen this yacht coming down because the, the, I put the compass on it and, and got, the, got the bearing. Then we, when then we saw a plane go over and there was no, you know, the planes that would have to be going to New Zealand. And the, way, the ones leaving New Zealand 
they could uh, go to Fiji or Tahiti or Panama or something like that. Uh, there's one plane once a week which goes to um, Chile, I think. So the planes, the track that they were on, they were heading due south, which means it would, would, have, would, it would have been going to Auckland, Wellington or Christchurch, which are all, all, all over the top of one another if it was heading south. So yeah. it could have been going to any one because it was coming yeah. straight down. So then I knew where I was. That gave us me a, gave a longitude of where we were. And then we saw a plane just, just after it had taken off and it was only about 60 miles away because it was still climbing. Yeah. So that gave me a latitude. So then I got the charts out and I thought, that's where we are. We were coming straight into um, Barrier yeah. Island. That was, that was in the last few days. And that sort of blows you away, knowing that you should have been heading to, heading to Chile and you're coming into the most populated sailing area the, in New Zealand. That, that is absolutely mind-blowing. It's been four months, in a, sort of in a state of deprivation. You know, you've you got 40 days, we went 40 days with no, with no water. We had um, four ounces of 7-Up or Coca-Cola or ginger ale and that sort of thing, which actually dehydrates you. And then on the 40th day it rained and we got water. And then we went for another 40 days with very little food, so we were having two, ta two teaspoons of uncooked rice a day. And you just soak it. And then, and the, the secret when you have very little food is chew every tiny little mouthful. And then the, f the last 40 days, we started all getting things together. And at the end of 40 days, bang, we're out of it. And three days before I, before I was out of it, I wrote in my log, um, is that enough? Can, can I go home now? Three days later, I was home. So I managed to um, create, a, create a miracle in 120 days. Well, Jonah, he was supposed to spend three days in a whale. And if you spent three days in there in, in deprivation, that, that is depriving the senses, depriving the senses of smell and touch and all those sort of things which keep you, you know, make you happy and all that sort of thing. So you de de deprive the senses and then after three days, he came out and he was sort of enlightened. Oh, and he came out after three days in a whale, you would have to be hospitalized, but he came out and he was transformed. I knew I was going to have to create a major miracle to get out of it. But when it did happen, it is just, it's, there's, there's nothing else comparable. In the last few years, I thought, well, it's about time I got into it because it inspires me. Because I think there's people nowadays don't know anything about adversity. Um, they seem to shy away from it. All the young people, they sit down and watch things on video and, and scared to actually do anything in case they might get into trouble, might hurt themselves. Or And it's only through adversity that, adversity that we'll become great. This is what's lacking in the world, you know, especially lacking in America is, is, a, is adventure. People doing, going out on adventure. My book was listed under autobiography and it sat next to Shirley MacLaine in the bookshop because there was no adventure section. That's very, rather sad. But I'm hoping that, you know, there's got to be some changes. I was wanting to, um, to write a book for adventure, for, to inspire pe people to go sailing and for armchair sailors. So I wanted to have, it, have a lot of photos in it you know, so it's all dotted all the way through the book, just in all in black and white. So that I noticed that when I was travelling to New Zealand doing book tours, it was the women who always come to me to buy the books for their husbands. Well, I thought, now, if the, hus the wives can buy the book for their husbands, and then their kids, eight-year-old kids, will pick the book up, and it will have lots of photos through it. So that will inspire them to go off and have adventures.
ancestor nocturnum, commonly known as uh, night, night blooming jasmine, and I'm never too far away from this. Wherever I go in the world, or where, as soon as I set up a new house somewhere, this is the first thing I buy, one of these plants. And you can smell this in the tropics, and I used to smell it everywhere, like the first island we went to in Ratonga, I used to smell it, and I wanted I look everywhere for it, but this scent is so powerful, it's the most powerful of all flowers, and it will drift two miles. And normally you have this planted right outside your bedroom window, so the person comes through at night time.